this panel connecting past and present Taiwan in the eyes of travelers, migrants, and citizens. Uh, we have uh, four presenters. Uh, um, Adina Tsemenek from Lancaster, University of Central Lancaster, uh, Beatrice Zani from McGill, and Helan is from uh, Shida at National Taiwan Normal University, um, and Isabel Chung from Portsmouth, UK, are in uh, uh, participating from online digitally. So um, we'll be watching them on online. Um, so thank you, everybody who's here, whether you're in person or online. And we'll go ahead and start. Everybody gets 15 minutes, and I will then show you the five minutes and one minute and no time, and um, and then we will have time for discussion. So thank you very much. And so, Adina, you may now take the podium. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, many thanks to the audience for being here. I'm very happy to be here at my first ever World Congress of Taiwan Studies. Um, right, OK. Um, recent changes um, related to world order, globalization, and new communication technologies have caused an increasing emphasis on network rather than a traditional club diplomacy uh, and on the role played by civil society actors who are embedded in transnational networks. Uh, Rhonda Zaharna uh, discusses a model of network communication in public diplomacy, uh, which also underscores the, the contribution of non-state actors. Unlike a mass communication model, which is centered around dissemination of information, the network model uh, approaches communication as a process. Uh, it is network members uh, who collaborate in using information um, to formulate coherent master narratives uh, relevant to culturally diverse standpoints um, and who swiftly generate uh, politically relevant information and move it to sites when it, we can, where it can make uh, the most impact. Another related concept is that of citizen diplomacy, which refers to private citizens um, and non-state actors uh, who participate in international forums uh, to advocate the image of a country uh, or who provide alternative strategies for mitigating difficult um, uh, relations between states or solving conflicts that um, uh, politician, polit political leaders cannot solve alone. Taiwan. Um, has had um, a mainly traditional approach to diplomacy centered on career diplomats. Uh, and various scholars have signaled certain problems uh, related to its public diplomacy, such as the lack of a strong unified actor with a clear strategy and with decision-making power in structuring uh, international communication. Um, and then officials uh, being not, often not prepared to adapt to local cultural contexts um, some scholars also refer to the fact that um, Taiwan's contested international status um, uh, restricts um, uh, Taiwanese institutions to conducting a kind of underground and invisible diplomacy instead of fully showcasing Taiwan's visibility as a political entity. Uh, my project uh, has been conducted since 2020 in collaboration with Taiwan Corner. Uh, it explores civil society groups and individual persons based in Europe. Um, so far, <coughs> sorry, I have contacted um, 10 organizations and one individual from several European countries. Uh, the groups I took into account are non-profits. Uh, they are informal or registered as um, NGOs or associations. Their core activities are quite diverse. They do political lobbying, uh, cultural promotions, discussion of current social and political issues. Um, they uh, curate or they organize film festivals. So far, I have conducted 24 hours of in-depth, semi-structured qualitative interviews uh, with founders, with chairpersons, uh, or with persons whom the groups themselves had designated as um, to represent the association. These are both Taiwanese and, and European citizens. Uh, I still feel that I'm very much at a preliminary stage in my project, um, and this is the first time I'm ever presenting it. Um, and due to time constraints, I'll be very selective. I'm mainly going to refer to one organization as a case study here. Uh, I included more information in my uh, paper that I'm happy to share. And I will discuss the following topics. First, um, how citizen diplomats uh, complement the activity of official uh, state Taiwanese institutions um, what problems they can address um, or solve uh, in an efficient manner. Secondly, uh, the embedded aspects of these actors' activities 
uh, from the viewpoint of a local ecology in the European countries where they are based. Thirdly, uh, the ne uh, networks these actors participate in uh, both at a local and a transnational level. And finally, uh, the factors that uh, motivate citizen diplomats' activity. For the first topic, uh, my most surprising findings are related to the Romanian uh, Association for Promoting Economic and Cultural Exchange with Taiwan, ROTA. Um, it was founded by two entrepreneurs, a Taiwanese and a Romanian citizen. Uh, now its activity is led by Romanian citizens. Uh, the most interesting aspect of their work uh, is that of a sort of an informal consulate or a Taiwan representative office, because Romania lacks um, a TRO and falls under the jurisdiction of the uh, TRO in Slovakia. The ROTA office, which I visited, um, resembled um, a TRO headquarters as well. Um, it had Taiwanese-style interior decoration, and there were lots of flyers and brochures on display. Uh, published by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the um, uh, Taiwan Trade Center in Bucharest. These were used by the Association for Introducing Taiwan to Local Politicians. ROTA uh, successfully intervenes with um, uh, Romanian border authorities uh, when Taiwanese citizens are refused entry to the country, to Romania, despite, despite uh, the fact that visa exemption agreements do exist. Um, they also help um, in case of problems encountered by Taiwanese tourists. They uh, help with formalities, they, they help arrange translators. Um, the association also strives to, to establish um, sometimes very roundabout standard procedures uh, for local recognition of university diplomas issued in Taiwan for both Taiwanese and Romanian citizens, uh, graduates. Um, uh, under a lack of officially established validation procedures or conventions. And ROTA is also entrusted by uh, the TRO in Slovakia with advertising scholarships to Taiwan um, in Romania and the preliminary selection of candidates. Uh, as for the second topic, uh, the problems that uh, ROTA addresses are very strongly embedded in, Ro in a Romanian context. Um, this um, is this context is um, um, Romania has a political environment that is very unfavorable to Taiwan, uh, which is strongly impacted by the PRC uh, and the one China policy in this understood in a very narrow sense. Um, on the one hand, Romania lacks um, agreements or an officially established framework for um, collaborative business with Taiwan or for diploma recognition. But on the other hand, Romania um, um, has very complex and procedures related to many things, and many official documents are required and notarized copies, which can be difficult uh, when the country of issue of a certain document is not recognized. So um, this is when uh, informal uh, networks are very important, um, networks that are usually cultivated uh, um, through, throughout a, a long period of time, um, um, the knowledge of the Romanian language is a key asset. Uh, Romanian citizenship is also an advantage. Uh, according to, um, to ROTA um, reports, um, key institutions in Romania uh, are sometimes unwilling or unwelcoming towards dealing with, with Taiwanese citizens. So uh, this is the reason why ROTA's involvement in dealing with local authorities can be uh, often effective. Um, other activities conducted by ROTA are in, uh, embedded in, or in, in its organizational status, and it's very interesting to see how they simultaneously meet the, um, the agendas of several actors. ROTA fun functions alongside, alongside Green Group, uh, that is a large corporation established as a novelty in Romania because it adopts a circular economy model and deals um, in waste recycling and processing. The chairman of uh, this, um, uh, this group uh, is also the chairman of ROTA. Um, and by providing donations um, of equipment made in Taiwan and funding for various Taiwan-related purposes, uh, the association seemed to fulfill a corporate social responsibility and thus fulfills the, the interests, uh, the agenda of, uh, of, of Green Group. ROTA donations um, conform to Green Group's corporate culture. Uh, they donate, for example, electrical mobility scooters, um, 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 and my interviewee emphasized that these are a green means of transportation. 
uh, the association is also very quick and creative in, in identifying and meeting local Romanian needs. Uh, they conduct regular in reviews of the news press in Romania. Uh, they consult um, survey data compiled by, by healthcare authorities or um, use the, the networks, the contacts with um, uh, local governments of cities where Green Group ha happens to have branches in. Um, and local governments in Romania often apply for EU funding and organize community events that um, conform to um, EU frameworks or requirements. The electric scooters were donated by Rota to the city government of Buzău uh, as part of the European Mobility Week. Um, that is an in initiative coordinated by the European Commission for Sustainable Urban Mobility. Um, the donations in Buzău also included a large outdoor multimedia screen that was used to build a community cinema, uh, summer cinema in a park. And such activities organized by Rota um, construct uh, a coherent image of Taiwan as a research and innovation hub and source of uh, high-tech products, which happens to also be in tune with uh, Taiwan's strategic interests in, um, uh, in Europe. Uh, in terms of networks, um, the networks that citizen diplomats um, can mobilize um, as resources for their activities are very notably transnational. Uh, now I'm going to be refer here only to the connections with the Taiwan representative offices, which are uh, a salient part of uh, citizen diplom diplomats' networks. Um, uh, despite a general positive assessment of the activity of TRO of contacts with the TROs, some participants um, attributed to, to the TROs a lack of flexibility uh, in approaching and managing issues outside um, established bureaucratic patterns and elitism seeking high-profile influential actors um, as, um, um, as targets for, for, for promoting or channels for promoting Taiwan, and being less inclined to engage um, citizen diplomats uh, as equal partners. Several interviewees reported the situation to have changed uh, during the, the, the last few years, um, and Rota and this relationship with the TROs in Slovakia and in Hungary can be best described in these terms. Uh, TRO officials often, often um, uh, have sought ROTA for emergency, emergency interventions, but it must be noted here that they, they tended to contact, according to my interview, we tended to contact directly uh, Taiwanese citizens rather than Romanian citizens for, for this, uh, these interventions. Some um, interviewees explicitly, explicitly distanced themselves from TROs, especially TRO funding. And I justified this through the value of independence, uh, which they understood as a lack of pressure um, uh, to conform to state agendas. Uh, the perceived risk was not related to any actual instances of control uh, over the citizen diplomat's profile or activities, but rather to this group's um, uh, public image or reputation as they wished to build it. Um, okay. Um, in terms of incentives, um, behind citizen diplomats' activities. Uh, one important incentive mentioned by many of them, um, external one, uh, for establishing groups um, or for a kind of milestone that led to intensification of their activity was the Sunflower Movement of 2014. But equally often mentioned were personal uh, incentives that sustain their activity in a, from a more long-term perspective. And here I, I noticed a slight difference between European and, uh, and Taiwanese interviewees. Uh, many European uh, interviewees mostly mentioned um, um, personal uh, and internal incentives, uh, personal circumstances, values, principles that constituted key drives for their uh, personal or professional life and not necessarily related to Taiwan, for example. Their personal status as uh, a minority uh, in a, uh, ethnic or linguistic terms, traditionally repressed or marginalized, that uh, constitute the reason for them to identify uh, with Taiwan and to claim more visibility for it. Another interviewee uh, was um, persistent in challenging established truths and authorities, um, and hence her willingness to, to counter established narratives about Taiwan and to propose alternative ones. On the other hand, um, uh, most Taiwanese participants uh, mentioned the combination of external and internal incentives, uh, and those were related to national identity. So um, for one of them, the civil society group that she joined, combined with elements from the um, uh, European environment, 
led her to increase her knowledge about Taiwan, um, about collective traumas in Taiwan's history, and her awareness of being Taiwanese during the 90s. Then, later on, um, um, potential threat from the China factor um, around the 1996 uh, presidential election, as well as later on in 2014, triggered a strong emotional response from her, fear, anger, determination of solidarity with, uh, with Taiwan and readiness for uh, active involvement in associations activities, lobbying for Taiwan in Europe, communicating Taiwan in Europe. So now very briefly as a conclusion, um, I think that the, the citizen diplomats I, uh, I took into account are very good examples for a network approach to public diplomacy. And the, um, it is their embeddedness in, uh, in their European context um, as well as partly the, um, um, the, the, the incentives um, they have, the individual incentives that, uh, for promoting Taiwan, uh, that constitute factors for the coherence of their narratives. Uh, but while um, personal involvement, personal commitment is often mentioned in theories of uh, volunteering and also of civil society uh, involvement in, um, in network diplomacy, uh, I think that uh, what is worth pursuing and what I want to pursue is um, this network aspect and, and this embeddedness in a local e ecology as a potential contribution to studies of citizen diplomacy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Adina. I know I'm very happy to uh, um, ask Beatrice Annie to come to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here today. And um, I've tried to play a little bit with the topic of our, uh, of our Congress, right? Uh, uh, Taiwan in the making. Uh, the making of Taiwan, Taiwan in the making, the making of what? Well, what I would like to discuss with you today is the making of globalization, the making of multiple forms of capitalism, which are informed and performed by migrants, migrants who use digital platforms, migrants who use digital platforms in Taiwan and across the different spaces uh, they, they go through actually during their mobility. And I do a little bit of self-promotion too, because what I'm going to tell you is, well, it's part of my ongoing research indeed, but it's also partially taken from my book, which was out six months ago. So it's very expensive. Get it both if you are happy. Buy your university libraries, Women Migrants in Southern China and Taiwan, published by, by Routledge. So let me, uh, let me bring you to to this fancy word of migrants, their smart, smartphones, WeChat commerce, line commerce, and the multiple shapes of globalization and capitalism. So in, in, in my previous work and in my ongoing work, I have been looking at the objects. I've been looking at the objects, the social life of things, the biographies of objects, of commodities, of artifacts to narrate other uh, things, to look at important uh, social processes, social phenomena and social transformation. Uh, beforehand, I've been working on a bra, an orange bra, which was made in China and commercialized by Chinese migrant women through digital platforms when they were living and working in, in Taiwan. And so the bra helps us to follow the women and follow their multiple economic, entrepreneurial, digital, emotional practices. But actually, if we walk around Taipei, or if we walk around Taoyuan, or if we go to Hukou, or many places in Taiwan, we do realize that the commercialization of objects or of artifacts is not only performed by Chinese migrant women. There are many migrants in Taiwan. Taiwan is an immigration country. Taiwan is a country of mobility, a society of arrival, a society of departure. So if in Taipei there are orange uh, fluorescent bras, if we go to Taiwan, Yuan, for example, we can find some tempeh, uh, which are soya, soya cakes commercialized by migrants who come from Indonesia. We could also find some DVDs imported by Vietnam, commercialized by some local Vietnamese migrants, and so on and so, and so forth. Um, 
as I said, Taiwan is a country of migration, of mobility, of immigration uh, from China, but also from Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Cambodia. There are so many male and female migrants who, through different channels, move to and settle down, eventually working in Taiwan. All of these populations are kind of heterogeneous, but what do they have in common? Well, they have something in common, which is kind of interesting, the migratory and mobility experience, but also multiple situations of vulnerability and of precarity that they do face in the Taiwanese society of arrival, and a certain tendency to cope with the discrimination on the jobs market through entrepreneurial activities. Nothing new under the sky if we look at the literature about migrants' entrepreneurship in the US, in Italy, in France, in South Africa, South America, we have this tendency to self-employment and auto-employment. And so what's, what's new? Well, the interesting thing is that these migrants use digital platforms in multiple ways during their migration, during their processes of settlement, and also during their entrepreneurial activity. We are increasingly moving from a transnationalist um, framework of analysis of migratory and mobility processes to a new form of, um, to a new actually analytical tool which is related to connectivity and to the new status of connected migrants that individuals on the move are taking are taking nowadays. And actually the very interesting thing, I had already observed this with Chinese migrant women and we can do this with other population is that entrepreneurship, commerce, self-employment are increasingly being individually and collectively produced and performed through and on digital platforms. Chinese women will use WeChat, a common application they are familiar with since their uh, experiences of life and, uh, and social uh, sociality in China. Uh, migrants from Indonesia or from uh, uh, Vietnam or from the Philippines will also use other social networks, Facebook and Line. What do the networks have in common? The fact that they can sustain and facilitate actually online payments, which in many cases are tax-free and invisible, and uh, simultaneity and in interconnection amongst networks of clients, commercial partners, and sellers, which are located in Taiwan, in their society of arrival, but also in other places in in Southeast, uh, in Southeast Asia. So how can migrants using digital platforms, and this is my puzzle which is still unsolved indeed, contribute to the making of new forms of entrepreneurial activities which perhaps if we look at them into a, a further perspective could inform of new economic geographies which connect Taiwan, which is their society of arrival, to the places they come from, and perhaps even to, well, increasingly globalizing places. So how does migrant digital entrepreneurship actually contribute or could contribute to broader socioeconomic transformations, which indeed uh, involve a form of digitized and Again, I move forward, bottom up, produced by individuals, individuals in a situation of precarity and vulnerability. Well, this sort of bottom up globalization, if we can call it like this. That I meted, I, I pass briefly, multi-sided ethnography carried out in Taiwan since 2018, biographical interviews associated to in situ observation of uh, professional and entrepreneurial activities of uh, male and especially female Chinese migrants, but uh, also interviews with male migrants from a certain number of Southeast Asian countries that you see listed on my PowerPoint. It, it is helpful at some point and associated, always associated and not exclusively to the sort of digital ethnography of, well, what's going on online of this e-commerce within different uh, digital platforms such as the ones I mentioned before. Um, interesting things, multiple products commercialized, multiple projects products commercialized which inform of the migratory paths of the different channels through which migrants arrive and settle down in Taiwan, but also different products, bras, 
tempeh, but also spicy meat, food provision, DVDs, newspapers, but also cosmetics, makeup and medicine, who uh, also in form of some rigid commercial import and export restriction between Taiwan and China, but also Taiwan and Southeast Asian countries. Commodities which in, in some cases contest borders and transgress spaces and geographies when they are being commercialized through the use of digital platforms, which to some extent make their mobility smoother, less visible, barely legitimate because those commodities are in some cases um, uh, subjected to import and export uh, restrictions. Indeed, the central role of this multi-sided social network of migrants who contribute to the making, to the very existence of this commerce, but also of these digitalized economic geographies and perhaps this form of bottom-up globalization. Um, but again, my question is, Taiwan in the making of globalization, which form of globalization? Can we really define it? Does globalization take only one shape or, on the contrary, can it take different shapes according to the different biographical, migratory, economic, entrepreneurial, mobility experiences of the very actors who produce and perform it on a daily basis, right? So this is my question. And my question is, is globalization only top-down? Is globalization only produced by Taiwan through its economic and diplomatic relations with Southeast Asia, of which the new southbound policy 2016 and relanced in 2018 is very much in Formative of is are we talking about this form of top bound top down globalization produced and performed by financial institutions or economic institutions or the sort of uh, Taiwan and Southeast Asia global or local or translocal or transnational governance and politics of well of connection of cooperation of economic partnerships. Uh, the interesting thing is that if we look from a very actor-oriented perspective at the ways this globalization is daily being produced and performed, we do realize that actually its actors and its producers are ordinary people. Someone would talk about the 99%, I talk about migrants here, who move from the payroll in Taiwan or even in their society of, of departure and the case of the Chinese migrant women who, who manufacture the bra within a textile factory they were employed in before moving to Taiwan is kind of paradigmatic of. Well, if we look at the actor, we realize that they are, well, they are employed in textile factories in Taoyuan, they can be farm workers, they can work in the care sector, they can sell vegetables on the street market, and in the meanwhile, in the evening, while their husband sleeps or where the children are quiet, they can arrange transnational e-commerce through the use of their smartphone and digital and digital platforms, right? Uh, we are perhaps in front of new forms of interconnection and Taiwan is perhaps a sort of pioneer of something that we might be able to observe in other parts of the world. So what is going on in Taiwan in terms of uh, connectedness of digitization of mobility and entrepreneurship might be helpful for us to understand something processes actually which are going on in other parts of of the world we are talking about more discrete geographies produced made in little made on a small scale which at the very same time help us to look under magnifying lenses right this sort of larger scale processes which perhaps are happening in other parts of the world. Uh, we are looking at, when we look at these digital geographies of uh, digital commercial and economic geographies of interconnection between Taiwan and Southeast Asia, we are actually observing simultaneously social, economic, commercial, digital, migratory process, which at the very same time take place and shape at the local, at a regional and at a global scale. This might help us, as I said before, and I will conclude on this, to look at 
broader, larger scale social, economic, commercial, digital, digital migratory transformation. And what are we talking about? I repeat it. The digitization of migration and of mobility and the digital age of migrant entrepreneurship. And if we look at the Chinese diaspora in California or perhaps even in Seattle, we might be uh, we, we might have under our nose actually very similar, very similar situations. So Taiwan helps us to understand, to frame something that under different forms it would be helpful and interesting to look at in other places. Um, what I'm trying to tell you is that from Taiwan to China, between Taiwan and China, from Taiwan to Southeast Asia, between Taiwan and Southeast Asia, and perhaps beyond, we might have in, we might be in front actually of digital commercial roads on new forms of connectivity on bottom up interconnection where the connected migrants play a major role in what well in this fabric of the plural polyform mutable changeable and uh, kind of daily constructed and performed globalization within uh, increasingly globalized and globalizing Taiwan. And thank you very much for your attention. So now we'll move on to the uh, the the ones online, and I, th I think I may have some need of assistance there with uh, telling people when the time is up. But uh, we will begin uh, uh, first with An Helen uh, from Taipei, and uh, I guess I I tell you when it's five minutes, and then you'll type it in. Is that? Oh, is it okay? Well, then we'll have no problem with this one. Okay, so we'll go ahead with uh, Anne's pre-recorded video. So thank you. I am much obliged to be with you at this wonderful occasion, although it is not in person. I have a special memory to share, though. This year's World Congress location at George Washington University in Seattle for me was the first NASA conference I attended 21 years ago in 2004. I was very much looking forward to visiting the city and the university again, but given the pandemic and my upcoming sabbatical next semester that I will be spending away from Taiwan, I did not consider it advisable flying back and forth twice, international distance in a short span time of less than six weeks. Not to mention the health and safety risk this still is bringing. First of all, a big thank you to the professional setup as usual. Evelyn asked us to make a facial video, and I've done my best to look and sound a bit pleasing. By the way, today is Dragon Boat Festival and the neighborhood is quite peaceful. My name is Anne Halen. I am professor in the Department of Taiwan Culture, Languages and Literature at National Taiwan Normal University and not entirely new to this community. Although the past few years I've been going on the slow side in terms of presentations and a continual research output. As one of the invited speakers in the EATS panel, connecting past and present, Taiwan in the eyes of migrants, travelers and citizens, my presentation focuses on working with historical narration and I look at the name giving and the meaning making of the term Formosa in digital newspaper corpora. I have submitted the paper and in the coming minutes I will situate this research in more general terms. I have been working on this project for a couple of years now. It may look very exciting, and that's what it also is, but its novelty, inclusive of the opportunities and the challenges, is that it combines different methods, humanities with technology, also known as the 
interdisciplinary academic field of digital humanity, which calls for specific approaches in formulating the research question and a lot of time spent on researching and becoming sufficiently acquainted with these new skills and methods. As with any research project, digital humanities also requires the building of a corpus, which is defined as the total text data, which for illustration here is a selected number of text passages that all have the key term for MOSA and which are accessible from the digitized newspaper databases, Belgica Press, and as the term denotes, these are the newspapers or the broadsheets published in the Kingdom of Belgium since 1830 and which cover the three national languages, Flemish, French, and German. Now, when we teach Taiwan historical topics, we pay specific attention to a particular work. It is not surprising that at one point, I also became curious to see how that geopolitical entity, Taiwan, has been and is contextualized in the Belgian newspaper. Taking on this task, I soon realized that it requires a very skillful balancing act, both in dealing with the limitations during the process of data collection from the perspective of how the source or that the newspaper intended the meaning and from the perspective of the researcher, whereby awareness of my own subjective disposition, which I cannot escape from, equally plays a role in the analysis of that Formosa historical method. Where am I going with this? My main aim is to build up a vocabulary that can indicate the newsworthiness of the term Formosa in a particular setting and use this pilot study to later on apply to a larger comparative or contrasting corpus and in so doing contribute to these research objectives that befit language acting as a tool of ideology. Now I switch to the digital method. In my Formosa coded corpus, I look for unit or word forms that have news value. I focus on how that word form A illustrates certain themes, and B relates to other units or word forms in the same text. That is known as the relational analysis. And then C, how these relations among themes act out the concept or a discourse in a wider network that is known as the network analysis. Relational mean that we have to pay attention to the context. And it is here that the researcher perspective surfaces as important. For instance, in 1930s news entries, the occurrence of the term headhunter from the newspaper perspective can state a fact, but the researcher's perspective delineates how and if that word form is interpreted in the context of the formal discourse, how and why it varies in meaning to the prosody over time, taking the variables of the periodization, the position in the layout, the title or the page number, and the journalistic background of the paper in which it appeared into account. The tools at hand are the traditional corpus linguistic tools, such as frequency lists, collocates, concordance output, that help to arrange and rearrange the data and its findings in function of the research. All this sounds great in theory, but the challenges when it comes to data acquisition as well as accessibility involve limitations of 
time, manpower, and money. How far have I come? In the paper I uploaded, I made a preliminary exercise looking at the data 1949-1950, and I was interested in how the change in US policy towards Formosa with the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950, traveled across the Atlantic and was reported in this European newspaper. Background reading informed me that the theme of the deployment of the 7th Fleet anchored in a threefold discourse. The transition from determined to non intervention to undetermined and the red menace to legitimate the presence of with the help of assistance, we pulled frequency lists of the highest occurrence of keywords, singled out uh, one subcorpus based on the keyword MacArthur, that is then General Douglas MacArthur. Then we selected the newspapers with the highest MacArthur occurrence, and I conducted a brief textual analysis to single out potential news. We compiled graphs and tables of the months and days that MacArthur featured in the news. And these are put aside for later comparative use with the rest of the corpus data. A preliminary finding resulted in the semantic prosody of the word form lot, whose news value in relation to Formosa is discursively representative of the red menace. As the court spans 1830 to 1950 and is trilingual, the pre-1895 periodization and the Japanese colonial period make up two other main periods. Extension into the Benelux region, including the Netherlands Dutch language corpus, and mainly the pre-1949 vocabulary items that may have informed the foreign affairs diplomatic views these are put against the background of the age of Bergen journalism and print capitalism at the turn of the 19th century and complete the project. And as such, are also the purpose of my upcoming sabbatical in a return to the library in Brussels, finalize the data acquisition, and further the reading for analysis. This is my brief presentation, and I thank you for your attention. Hi, my name is, is Hi, my name is Isabel Cheng. I am the Secretary General of European Association of Taiwan Studies, and I'm based at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. It is my great pleasure to join my East colleagues, including Dr. Zani, Dr. Zamanek, and Dr. Halen, to present our research, but I'm not going to present my own uh, personal research. Instead, I will represent uh, EADS and three other organizations about the project we undertake together that is aimed to serve the interest of people like you who do research on contemporary or historical Taiwan. So let me share my screen first of all so that uh, I will not go off my script so this is the first page so the project is Tai Trans Taiwan a research gateway to Taiwan studies and targets so now let me show you in a slideshow mode and I will start by explaining how targets came into being. This is a brainchild of the a close a collaboration amongst the, these four organizations, including EADS, the North American Taiwan Studies Association, NATSA, the International Journal of Taiwan Studies, 
by JTS, that is financially supported by INTS, and the Association for Taiwan Literature at all. We aim to build an easy, open, and sustainable access so that people like you can have to enjoy the support of the rich research resources deposited at institutions within and beyond Taiwan. We couldn't have our vision and the passion realized without this uh, generous support of the CCK Foundation. So this presentation also gave us a great opportunity to thank them for their grant. So let me now move on to uh, explaining to you the rationale. So advances in digital technology have allowed ministries, archives, libraries, museums, herbariums, research institutions, and even individuals to digitalize and deposit their resources online for wider, faster, and easier access. However, a common problem, or I shouldn't say a problem, an issue exists in these databases. That is, usually the websites are written in Chinese. Thus, for researchers whose working language is not Chinese, these databases became less approachable, even less visible. So if you are uh, doing research like um, uh, Dr. Zani's research, you, you probably need to know demography, you need to know the number of people moving in and out of Taiwan or elsewhere and you need access to this kind of database. Actually, I'm talking about myself. I often need to use uh, uh, the statistics about uh, migrants in and out of Taiwan. So where can you find it and how you can utilize it? However, it would be a mammoth undertaking and perhaps an untainable goal to translate the content of these resources from Chinese to English. However, we reckon that the issue of approachability and visibility can be addressed if these databases are grouped together by an English language portal that is our sense of ident our identity now as a portal builder that could provide research guides written in English and direct researchers like you and me to those existing resources. So, what do we include? We include four types of the materials. Uh, firstly, annotated bibliography, referring to the abstracts of English language journal articles. Archives, refer to the archival materials in the possession of government or research institutions. Database, uh, refers to the information or uh, statistics, as I mentioned just now, in the possession of governments, research institutions, or social organizations. Resources uh, refer to information warehoused by a wide variety of Taiwan studies entities based in Taiwan and beyond. These entities, including um, regional associations, research centers, research programs, degree awarding uh, courses, or funding agencies. Some of these entities or their representatives are also participating in this great conference. So um, the, let me now go into details about each of them. So the uh, um, annotated bibliography in this section, uh, we will provide two types of information, including the introduction about the journal, and also the publicly available abstracts of articles. The, the list of um, uh, the journals we include for this section comprises journals in humanities and social sciences. So we'd like to take the, this opportunity to thank Professor Zhang Wongzhi for his uh, valuable support for providing a list of journals identified by the Institute of Taiwan History of Academia Sinica for their relevancy for publishing research in the fields of Taiwan studies. The archives are now the section. We will provide the links and research guides pertaining to the archive uh, collections 
the these archives provide text-based materials and that is a traditional documents memorandums diplomatic cables and even um and as well as visual um audio and physical materials such as maps recordings music recordings or even um, specimen or textile our ambition is to include archives based in the us uk japan and a number of european countries and of course in cyberspace database in this section we will focus on databases established by university, research institutions, or non-profit organizations. One of our favorite examples is uh, the, um, the, the, the Taiwan Association of Soundscape. We will provide research guides that summarize their content and potential use. The resource section provides resources housed by, as I mentioned just now, a variety of Taiwan studies entities. So at this stage, we will prioritize to uh, showcase resources that are already in our possession. Uh, it, that means Eats, Nutter, and Atoll. So let me just briefly mention that at Eats, we have a wealth of uh, collection of conference papers that really demonstrate the change of continuity of the subjects that have been pursued by the uh, Transnational Taiwan Studies Scholars. In our uh, biannual publication of each news, we also include the profile of uh, Taiwan Studies entities or individual scholars and the uh, uh, grants reports who, uh, which are written by the people who receive our grants and reporting their success or their findings. We also include each issue the uh, a list of uh, self-reported uh, publications of each members. At NUTSA, they have these two flagship projects. One is a Taiwan Studies syllabus, another one is Experts in Taiwan Studies. At the Association of Taiwan Literature, they have established these two great databases. One is the 1980s Born Taiwanese Writers Database, and the, the, the other one is a Taiwan Literature Course Template. So in the, on this slide, I'd like to share with you what we have found when we, ha when, when we started working on this uh, target project. The, we have made a strategic decision that we will prioritize um, the, the building of the uh, annotated bibliography and resources section. This is um, partly because they are um, easier to um, collect and reproduce and working on these two sections rather than the more complicated database and archives sections will allow us to develop the prototype establish our taxonomy build a research uh, build a search function on the website and standardize the content production one of the valuable lessons we have learned is regarding the issue of presenting Taiwan. We continue to be challenged by the issue of Romanization. On the surface, there seems to be just an issue that can be dealt with by making editorial decisions, that is to choose to use either Wei Giles or Han Yu Pinyin or any other existing or commonly used methods of method, uh, Romanization. However, deep down, we have realized, um, and I'm sure um, you probably have also come to the similar conclusion that uh, how to present Taiwan will have an impact on its visibility um, because Taiwan or Formosa have been used for the archives or libraries for their uh, cataloging their collections. This is obvious uh, throughout English and uh, European language materials and uh, through the uh, presentation of um, 
um, Dr. Halen, you will have the sense that um, in, in Flemish, French or Dutch language, whether you search uh, Taiwan or Formosa, you may have uh, different results. Similarly, we have also found this issue in German language materials. This is partly related to the historical affiliation of Taiwan with China and Japan. Another similar issue is periodization, which is also beyond the pure technicality. When we develop the uh, uh, annotated bibliography section, we're being challenged by the issue of relevancy. That means that um, in different kinds of publications, there are different ways, uh, they, they are different degrees of um, um, the relevancy of this publication to do with Taiwan. That is, they either talk about, they either research about Taiwan or they mention Taiwan or they are related to Taiwan or they compare Taiwan as a case study with another case study. So um, with this different degrees of relevancy, we realize that how we manage this issue will have an impact on the visibility of certain publications. It is a critical challenge in itself, showing how the study of Taiwan can actually help, if we handle it well, can help to diversify or enrich disciplinary knowledge and area studies knowledge, which in turn will have implications for the decolonization of Western centric knowledge and academia. In terms of producing research guides, we realize um, that the to include to introduce users to the potential of those materials for research writers need to be familiar with the current literature and to have an insight to the content of the materials they will also have to be able to envisage the uh, the usefulness of these materials in order to help researchers advance uh, their research agendas. So while we um, a, a large pool of uh, guide writers beyond academia may also be needed if we want to introduce more special collections such as diplomatic cables, sound or music recordings or botanical specimens <laughs> um, such as those uh, collected by the Herbarium or the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew in the UK. So while we endeavour to identify potential um, archives or databases, we also have come to the uh, uh, realisation that it really has to be a concerted efforts to fund the restoration, conservation or digitization of materials that are fast decaying because they're fragile mediums such as paper, tapes, negatives or fabrics. To build uh, the section um, about the resources, we will endeavour to support researchers at different stages of their career. Hence, we also realize that a different stage of uh, different uh, career, researchers at different stage of careers also have different needs when they were looking for information about Taiwan studies, such as a course, um, syllabus, curriculum, or uh, even funding sources. So the content of the section really has to take into account the divergent need and in order to make it relevant to them. So now let me conclude. The, our commitment to providing this gateway to the rich materials will put Taiwan studies in a landscape of new area studies. This new area studies is somewhere that uh, a bottom-up perspective interacts with the 
concepts of power or interest that have dominated traditional area studies from a top-down perspective. So while we are continuing our um, construction of this transnational interactive research-oriented and interdisciplinary portal, we also welcome your contribution. So if you have any questions about uh, targets at this conference or after this conference, please get in touch with us and better even if you would like to make contributions in any possible way. So thank you very much for your listening and I will look forward to your questions at the Q&A session. So she's asking, what is the origin of the EATS panel? How did you uh, um, organize it? Was it a group of EATS people who came together and decided to do something? Or was it the uh, WCTS people who uh, pulled together your, pa your papers and made it to an EATS panel? So maybe, uh, maybe Anne or Isabel, you, Isabel, maybe you would know that? Isabel, it looks like you got your hand up. Isabel. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I hope it doesn't sound too technical, but uh, he's been uh, invited to attend this conference. Um, but um, the um, so the three colleagues were submitting their work, um, and that could really showcase their research and their strength. But for myself, uh, originally I was scheduled in a different panel that is about the so-called new sources for Taiwan Studies research. But because of a clash with something else, I couldn't I couldn't go to Seattle because of a lack in childcare. I don't know if you see my son appearing just now, topless, really embarrassing. Uh, because of him, I couldn't go. And then uh, because of other clash, uh, I, then I was rescheduled to be here. But um, the but I, I want to take this opportunity to say that uh, actually what I presented is, is not uh, so remote from what colleagues are doing here in this panel. Because what I wanted to bring out is how this project we have now been funded to do can really support uh, interdisciplinary research. It actually may look like we could work best for Anne's kind of research because it's about archives, about um, historical records. But as I tried in the, in the presentation just now, even projects uh, like Adina's, I was listening to Adina's project just now, and I think this kind of um, data, you know, of different countries well, in Romania, in Hungary, in um, um, Poland or Czech or Slovakia, you have these uh, tiny, teeny, well, maybe not so tiny, teeny, small organizations, but what they're doing is also worth archiving. So our um, ambition is to uh, re record uh, what's going on contemporarily and also historically in order to enrich the resources that are available for us to do uh, Taiwan studies, particularly like uh, um, Beatrix said just now, Taiwan is a good example for globalization, depending on how you look at it, transnational, global or local. And I think our project that opens itself for all kinds of uh, archival uh, archiving activities can serve that kind of purpose. I hope this is not a, a, a roundabout way to answer the question, but there's a bit of a technical concern there, but it's also a real genuine interest in trying to incorporate different kinds of disciplines, different kinds of methods for doing research about Taiwan. Thank you. That is okay. okay. Oh, we've got lots of questions, so... Okay, so this is a question I'm going to repeat that to, to, uh, to both Adina and Beatrice, because they're both talking about globalization and they made a contrast between bottom up and top down. So how does globalization look different if we're looking at it from the bottom up? So you can both come up here and... Thank you very much for this uh, question, which is indeed uh, very interesting and also hard to hard to answer. And actually, I, you know, you may you might find it bizarre, but I mentioned bottom up and top down globalization, but I'm not myself sure that we can really stick in to this kind of 
rigid taxonomies and and dichotomies, right? This has been this has been uh, characterizing scholarship actually for a very long time, and um, I, I've tried myself to to also to to go against such a rigid uh, schematic uh, um, division binary division. Actually, the thing is that indeed it's easier to talk about top down and bottom up because we simplify when, especially when we look at the actors who produce globalized and globalizing practices on different scales through different, you know, uh, at different levels. Uh, we are talking about economic practices, social practices, cultural practices, it could be religious practices if we if we put it into another perspective and, and etc. The thing is that uh, perhaps, especially because we live in a world of connectivity, of interconnection, of simultaneity and globalized exchanges, right? Uh, the two forms of globalization, actually, they, they, they lose their dichotomic meaning because they mutually inform and construct each other. I will give you just a quick example and then I give the word to Adina. Um, I told you the story of this, I mentioned the story of this bra. So I have been looking at this orange bra, which was made in China by a, a Chinese proletarian, a Dago Mei, who moves from the countryside to the city, who works in the factory, who produces this, this artifact, right? And then this artifact will change its life because when, because when she, this migrant moves and settles down in Taiwan through marriage and, and other stories, actually, she gives it a new life from an artifact, this bra becomes a commodity, right? Which navigates through local and global physical and digital seas, metaphorically commercialized by this migrant through WeChat. And actually this commodity becomes an emblem of what? Well, of emancipation of, uh, well, at, at least an attempted uh, upward social mobility and at least uh, of uh, determination, proud, and motivation among these migrants. However, the ways she has, she puts this object on move and she has the bra circulating partially responds uh, to the, well, rules of the exchange, the capitalistic frame in which she had been professionally socialized when she was working in China in terms of logistics, in terms of mobilization of partners and commercial clients, but also the way she packs, uh, she she, she wraps it, she puts it into parcels, and she sends it or she ships it through shipping and trading companies, right? However, she performed it in another way. To, to a certain extent, she was part of a capitalistic frame, but even though she was exploited within this, that frame, she learned something, skills, competences, um, techniques, and whatever, and she reframed that while producing digital commerce. Isn't this an example of how globalization, top-down, bottom-up, capitalistic frame and migrant, vulnerable, uh, uh, nomad uh, to entrepreneurship mix and merge together and take new hybrid and secretic forms? I think so. Question, uh, which as uh, is um, Patrick just said, uh, I, I also find it hard to answer. Uh, so I don't have a straightforward answer. Uh, but thank you for the question because it got me thinking. So what uh, I, I can only say what comes to my mind right now, fast. And what comes to my mind is that the difference uh, may be in the power, then uh, and the authoritative character of each of. The, the state institutions and citizen diplomats as, uh, as sources of discourse. Because while um, state institutions may have already established patterns, forms for promoting Taiwan, which can be limiting but also empowering, let's say, uh, citizen diplomats need to create their own patterns. So I think that the difference is in creating uh, and performing and coming up with something rather than knowing beforehand what you can do. And I think that um, maybe, I don't know about the state institutions, um, they were in Taiwan, those instructors with public diplomacy were often accused of not being able to catch up with the, the connectedness of the contemporary world. So maybe uh, they may not take for granted uh, the globalized, mediatized uh, the state in which the world is. 
but both of them, both of these actors may take for granted the fact that they do live in this kind of world. And the, the difference may be that one source is powerful and knows what to do, uh, which can be limiting, of course. And the other source uh, knows, uh, doesn't know and has to create that, which can be frustrating. <laughs> so that's what comes to my mind right now, I think. So, Isabel, these are mostly questions for you. Is your, is your, um, uh, because she's a member of the Taiwan Digital Humanities Project, and she wanted to know if anybody from that project is working on your team, and she wanted to know if the uh, digital archive is up and running yet. Thank you so much. That's that's precisely why we wanted to present here, and that's precisely why I invited people to join our project. Um, and the answer is no because uh, we try to work with the uh, Academia Seneca and uh, is, uh, there's some other, there's some some kind of technical issues that that made made uh, our collaboration not happening but i'm very um, helpful that uh, for people like yourself can join us because what uh, we uh, what i noticed that there's no shortage of similar projects as we are doing there's actually plenty and the but i think what we outside of taiwan have a, a very unique uh, advantage which is we know better about things outside taiwan so i kept saying uh, i always tell people my favorite topic is uh, herbarium at, at the kew gardens because my husband works there and i was told uh, there were thousands of uh, uh, specimen collected during colonial time and that is an example and the Anne's uh, research is a, a perfect example that as long as you you're willing to find you'll find things so the uh, as the current stage as i presented in the in the in the recorded uh, talk that we we are um, we are almost ready I didn't, uh, I didn't have time to um, show the live site because it hasn't gone live. But at this stage, our annotated bibliography is the prototype has been established and the resources section about uh, uh, ease about nuts uh, is almost uh, ready to, um, to test a prototype. But the archives and the, the databases are yet to be done. And that is because we understand that the mammoth challenge we are undertaking but please contact me if you think you can help and that will be most appreciated and our great ambition is that after because this funding only goes for two years but we hope that cck will see our effort and also see how it can be used so we hope that after two years which is uh, 2023 uh, may 2023 will be open we'll be able to open this project for public participation because knowledge production should be democratic and should be democratized. And who knows better than, um, uh, well, people who knows their, their subject should uh, um, have the opportunity to uh, participate. So the, and my ambition is also not only collect what is already there online, but it's also to collect a really unique, a special or um, a personal collection. In that sense, I'm talking about myself. Um, uh, my father passed away a few years ago and he left uh, 40 years worth of uh, diaries. And I come um, through research, I came across uh, other people who have uh, also their family members, their spouses, passing away and I have left a lot of a wealth of knowledge. How can we collect this kind of thing? We don't own space to hold them. We are only a site we only exist in cyberspace. Wow. But I hope I hope we could uh, include that kind of small collection so that the research about Taiwan could be done in a very democratic way in terms of the uh, sources and where the sources are collected. So this is my uh, uh, reply to this very uh, good question. Now uh, please contact us. Thank you. So we have uh, two minutes left. If there's one short question, I think we can take that. So, Dominique? Yeah, and he's asking as a historian, and historians tend to be very skeptical about using newspapers as historical Ooh. sources. So how would you, as a, as a how, would, how would you, thinking about literature and so forth, use uh, newspapers as a source, 
Look, can you give me half a year? I'm going on sabbatical and I'm going to figure all this out, really. I mean, I've been in Taiwan two years and a half and uh, I do understand you have these questions. I'm struggling with them as well. So hopefully when I come back from my sabbatical next semester, back to Taiwan, I can answer this uh, in, a, in a more accurate and a more positive and a more whatever way, but not right now at, uh, at the moment, because it's really something I'm struggling with too. And I need to be away from this island in order to sort that out. I hope this is sufficient for now. Thank you. Yeah, I think that has to be sufficient for now because time is up. So yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> And we, we now, for those of us who are here, thank you very much for those of you who are very early in the morning in Taiwan. Uh, so now it's time for your breakfast. <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> for those of us here, we'll have a coffee break for 30 minutes in room 332. So, okay, thank, thank you. you, Simon. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, ciao, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.